The decision at the Federal Court of Appeal at that time, which was about a year before that, so January 2015, was that federal regulated employers could terminate uh, a non-managerial, non-unionized employee um, without cause. Now, the Supreme Court of Canada came in this year and said, no, you can't. So the procedure under the Canada Labor Code is that you make a complaint to the inspector. The inspector then writes to, within 90 days. So I should put that out there. This complaint has to be made within 90 days. So he made the complaint. Um, once you make the complaint, they try to work with you and the employer to see if you can resolve the matter. And then if you can't, they refer it to a, an adjudicator. So the powers of the adjudicator, basically, are under 242. And it allows them to consider the complaint uh, within a prescribed time period. And then it allows the adjudicator to determine the process in which uh, they are to make submissions, uh, collect evidence, um, and then consider the information without the complaint with the view that the adjudicator will then be able to make a determination. There are three places that we need to look when we are trying to figure out what an employee is entitled to when their employment is terminated without cause. So the first place we have to look at is employment standards legislation. So in Ontario, that's the Employment Standards Act 2000. And as Flora has mentioned, for federally regulated employees, that is the Canada Labour Code. So under the Ontario Employment Standards Act, Employees are entitled to termination pay, which is one year, or sorry, one week rather, per completed year of service, up to a maximum of eight weeks. And then some employees may also be entitled to severance pay, which is an additional one week per year of service, up to a maximum of 26 weeks, provided that they have at least five years of service with the employer. And the either the employer has an annual payroll of two and a half million dollars or if the employer has engaged in a mass layoff or mass termination as defined in the uh, Employment Standards Act. We also have to look at the employment contract and that's where termination clauses will come in and then thirdly we have to look at the common law so if there is either no termination clause or an unenforceable termination clause, the common law becomes relevant. And something to keep in mind is that the employee's common law entitlement will likely be significantly more than their minimums set out in the Employment Standards Act. So that's why this is important. So the employee's employment is terminated in September 2013 because the magazine sales were declining. And the defendant to uh, CFT makes an offer to settle for 33 weeks. So 21 weeks were based on the employee statutory minimums. So eight weeks of termination pay, which is the one week per year up to the maximum of eight weeks. And then the, the employer also paid the 13 weeks of severance pay. So that's the one week additional one week per year. So 13 years of service, 13 weeks of severance pay. So there's your total of 21 weeks. And then the employer agreed to pay an additional 12 weeks of pay in uh, exchange for a release. And uh, the employer also maintained voluntarily the employee's benefits until March of 2014. Now that wasn't good enough for the employee though, so they, the employee did not accept the offer and sued the, uh, the center. What is employee fraud or, or occupational fraud? Well, there's an organization called the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, which does a lot of work, and you can look them up online, and I suggest you do if you have any interest in this topic. They do a lot of work in terms of documenting, raising awareness uh, for employee fraud and occupational fraud, um, and they have sort of a, a, a complicated and technical definition of, of what fraud is that you can see on the slide there. For common folk, uh, for, for, for those of us who are not certified fraud examiners, fraud is sort of one of those things that you, you tend to know it when you see it. So, so there are some, some sort of commonplace examples, okay? Falsifying expense reports by employees, 
uh, improper use of sick leave, saying you're sick when you're not sick, uh, accepting bribes and kickbacks is, is a big one and one that you read about in the news, especially uh, in, in the construction industry. Uh, and then there's the more straightforward theft or, or asset misappropriation, you know, to be taking money right, right out of the cash register that I work behind, or something a, a little bit more complicated, complicated accounting schemes and things like that uh, in order to get money out of a company. So from an employment law perspective, though, there are really two issues that arise. One is, when is there cause to terminate? And we, we talk a lot at these seminars about whether there's cause or not cause in any particular cases. The further issue that arises as well from a legal perspective is what about recovery? So you have these cases, sometimes large-scale thefts or asset misappropriation. What's the employer going to do to actually try to get some of that money back? So I'm going to talk a little bit about each of these. When there's cause for dismissal. So generally, an employee has a duty of good faith and fidelity to the employer. It's not going to come as a surprise if I say if an employee is defrauding their employer, then they're going to be in breach of that duty. In many cases, these are not these complicated, well, is there cause, is there not cause, is it really that bad? Well, if I'm stealing cash out of the cash register, there's probably going to be cause for termination. But we have to be very cautious as employment lawyers because there's fraud or there's theft with, you know, a capital T theft, and then there's theft, well, maybe it's not always such a big deal. Simple dishonesty is not always going to give rise to cause for termination. And really the issue is, um, from, from a very, very nuts and bolts perspective is, has the action of the employee um, uh, risen to a level that it's so egregious to undermine the faith and confidence that the employer can have in that employee? In other words, it's sometimes put this way, can the employer still trust that employee? Now, the first analysis that one needs to ent entertain is whether or not the person intends to work in Canada. So the first question I have here is, is the activity work? What is work? Work is defined as an activity for which wages are paid or commission is earned, or that competes directly with activities of Canadian citizens or permanent residents in the Canadian labor market. Many people think, well, I'm, if I'm not being paid in Canada, either I'm being paid by my employer in the U.S., or I'm volunteering my work in Canada. I, I don't need a work permit. That's incorrect. It, uh, the, it's a two-pronged test. Either one is receiving remuneration in Canada, or the nature of the activity is such that it competes with Canadian citizens. In other words, you're potentially taking a job away from a Canadian, even though you're not being paid for what you're doing. So what is a labor market impact assessment? In essence, it verifies that there is a need for the temporary worker and that there are no Canadians available to do the job. The employer is required to test the Canadian labor market by recruiting Canadians. And it's a complex uh, system. Advertising has, be has to be done on a federal job bank and various other uh, media must be used. You need to satisfy the Service Canada officer that you've looked diligently in the Canadian marketplace to find someone to fill the role. Um, so everyone's favorite topic has been left for last, tax. I know you're all very excited. Um, so I'm going to talk about tax issues for cross-border employees. As Asher indicated, we uh, work together very often on cross-border uh, files uh, because without exception, the corporations really don't realize that they do have uh, potential tax consequences. They just think they are non-resident corporations. They're sending people across the border. They can't possibly have any tax implications here in Canada because none of the parties are Canadian. Well, in fact, that's not the case. And in virtually every case, there are going to be tax ramifications. And I'm going to talk about here, you can see by way of overview, the different categories of residents, 
what are the considerations are in becoming a different, uh, being considered a, a factual, a deemed, or a non-resident, the tax treatment of each uh, type of resident, and the income tax obligations both for the employer and the employee. The tax treatment of the different categories. Clearly a factual resident, just like those of us who permanently reside in Canada, um, notwithstanding that we may be citizens of other countries, are subject to Canadian income tax on our worldwide income. If you are a deemed resident, then again, as I indicated, a deemed resident is a person who has not established sufficient ties to be considered a factual resident. Some of the tax consequences there, um, first of all, they are subject, they're still subject to Canadian income tax on their worldwide income for the whole year. So no difference in treatment if you're a deemed resident versus a factual resident with respect to what is subject to tax and for how long. However, if you're a deemed resident, you do have certain disadvantages. For example, you're not considered a factual resident for provincial income tax credits, and therefore you would not be entitled to provincial tax credits uh, or potentially to provincial benefits. And then finally, a non-resident of Canada is only subject to Canadian income tax on their Canadian source income, and that includes business income and property income. Um, as always, uh, we, we do this for you guys, and we hope it's helpful and informative, and we welcome your feedback. So uh, if there are topics that you would like us to address at the next seminar or you have some suggestions for us, uh, by all means, uh, send those along, and we will uh, try and incorporate those. Uh, our next seminar will be in the spring, as per usual, and so I hope uh, each of you will keep that in mind and look for the uh, reminders that will come out with specific dates uh, going forward. So thank you to everyone, and I'll uh, let you get back on with your day. Thank you.